Today's program is brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. Did you know that Wisconsin is home to the nation's only master cheesemakers program that provides innovative cheesemakers with continuing education opportunities? To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Welcome to The Line. I'm your host, Eli Sussman. I'm the co-owner and chef of Samisa Restaurant in Williamsburg. If you're just joining us for the first time, each week on this program, I sit down with a chef or restaurant owner, and I discuss the trajectory of his or her life and their career. So basically, we start off where they grew up, their first jobs in food, and then how they ended up where they are today. I'm excited to welcome my guest today, Vinny Milburn, as he holds a unique position as being the first fishmonger. Welcome to the program. Uh, we've never had someone with his level of expertise uh, from the wholesale and sourcing side of operations, so we're excited to welcome him. Vinny's great great grandfather founded the wholesale fish uh, distributor and wholesale operation, the John Nagel Company in Massachusetts in the 1880s. Uh, Vinny worked for the company in Boston, where he learned all aspects of the commercial fishing industry. He specializes in high quality, sustainable seafood for upscale restaurants all over the New York area. Uh, presently, he's the co-owner of Greenpoint Fish and Lobster, a restaurant and retail seafood market, which is located in Greenpoint. They have a retail seafood food market in Long Island City, and they do distribution from that center as well. So we're going to be talking about all things restaurant related, but also fish, distribution, sourcing, when's the best time uh, to purchase, and also the fluctuating market. Vinny, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me. I want to begin, as we often do on the line, with your earliest memories of food. I imagine for you, this may start on a boat or <laughs> perhaps in a in a room where fish is being butchered. Uh, talk a little bit about being a, a young kid whose family is in the the fish business. Um, well, my in I guess the late eighties, my my mom started driving into Boston every day to work at the family company. And this was at the time when the Big Dig was going on, and we often took trips in with her and saw the um, the the floor of the, of the family company, which has been in its current location since 87. Uh, the company has been in Boston since about, since 19, uh, since 1887. Um, it's a family owned, uh, small company, all my, <laughs> There's many cousins, brothers, uncles, aunts uh, that work there. I work there. Um, it's a uh, it's it's a real family affair. Um, so I guess from from my perspective, it was it wasn't really expected for the uh, for kids to go into the company. It was always there if you were interested, which I always was. Um, my youngest brother Ian works there now. My middle brother Alex wants absolutely nothing to do with it. He doesn't. Uh, he doesn't want to do it. And, you know, there is a, a certain sort of um, masochistic quality to wanting to work in fish because it's it's a uh, long hours and a, you know a trickle of pennies instead of uh, a Scrooge McDuck uh, sort of. <laughs> and it's physical work. I mean, it's it's, it's a it's, lot yeah. of moving of ice and fish and yeah, buckets and and, and it, you're dealing with a highly perishable product. So even if it comes in at, at peak freshness, you have a very limited sh- window to sell it. And you never know if something's going to come in and disrupt, disrupt the market. And something that you bought at four dollars is now worth two. And you just have to take a bath on it. So it, it's kind of like it's the, like the stock market. The it, fluctuations it are tremendous, and you almost need a little. You need not only like inside information of when the boats are coming in, but you also just need to really understand the lay of the land, right? You need to know weather you need yes. to know shipping yeah. patterns you need to know gas prices to get it into the city um does uh does does the the folks that that work at the business that that got involved um 
Do both of your parents, if they are still working there, what are their roles there? Are are neither of them involved anymore? No, so so my my mom is actually the the fish side, and okay. she was uh she was the I like that the fish side. <laughs> yeah, so my my dad's a, a house painter. Okay, and, um, so he, well, I guess he painted the the building a couple times. So I mean, it really is a, a true family affair. Um, but uh, she she doesn't work there anymore, mainly just because I grew up outside of Boston, and the traffic is just is terrible to get in, and she just got sick of doing it every day. Um, but you know, I I have thirty eight first cousins on my mom's side, and then uh, my my second cousins that are all the the Nagels of the John Nagel Company. That, uh, there's many of them that work there. Sometimes when I bring guests into the company and. Someone says like, oh, "Well, who was your cousin there?" I said, "Well, which one? The, the cousin, 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 cousin." I mean, every it's single person. Easier to just there. say who's not a family member at that point. And w- we end up doing saying that they say, "Well, he's worked for the company for forty three years, but you know, he's not really a member of the family." But, but, he, is but he is a family member at that sure. point. Uh, what is the the scope of that operation? Um, do, if you can speak a little bit to just kind of like size and you know how many folks work there or how what's the distribution channels like? I mean, is it one of the bigger ones in it's, Boston? Yeah, it, it's one of the bigger. Um, we have over a hundred employees. Uh, the The footprint is twenty five thousand square feet. I think uh, it's if you're familiar with Hassop, it is it is two levels up from Hassop called like SQF level two or something. It's Everything is uh, is prepared in in the cleanest environment with um, with the most respect for uh, for proper handling and it's a uh, it's an old building. Um, it was actually built in the '40s to to move sub- submarines, um, but we've been there since the '80s. Um, it, it it's a pretty it's a pretty impressive company. But I when I worked there, uh, I, I you know I was younger. I wasn't really thinking about what I wanted to do, and I certainly didn't want to do fish. Uh, my mom didn't want me to do fish, Spe- be, give, given that we were working in the same building, and it's not really uh, a great lifestyle. Um, so I ended up going to law school and graduated and took the New York bar, mainly only because when you take the bar, you usually have to go through uh, a character and fitness examination before you take the bar and they say you're able to sit for the bar but that was a lot of work and I didn't feel like doing it in Massachusetts in New York you just sign up and take it so I signed up took it and then passed the character and fitness and then I said you I, I, you know, I guess I'm gonna move to New York so after spending time being really on the ground in this fishing business, working on the floor with your cousins and with your mom and stuff, you pursued a different route for a little while, uh, and you became. Did you become an entertainment lawyer? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I still, I still practice uh, a little bit. Um, I grew up. Uh, you were, on, you on, were, you were in the market at one a.m. this morning, and what you're going to put on a suit later today? And <laughs> <laughs> go well, luckily, entertainment some, lawyers don't wear suits, but they look over some contracts. Well, I mean, I still, uh, I still do pro bono work mm-hmm. and um, helping artists that are, are unable to afford legal representation. Is something that I consider to be pro bono, and I'm helping these these guys. And, and luckily, I, I grew up on the on the punk side of the spectrum in a in a working class town in Massachusetts. And there's uh, there's there's plenty of people there that that need help. Great great artists that um, are looking for a p- little legal representation. So I do that from time to time. But I I did move to New York, and my partner Adam, he and I had worked on a project in I guess 2000, 2010, uh, 2009, 2010, somewhere around there. He was uh, managing a band that I had a a DIY label that I put the record out and that project didn't really work out too well um and then i was living in new york doing music stuff he was doing music stuff we ran into each other at a, at a holiday party and he said you know what I, I i'm having a hard time finding good fish in my neighborhood and i said well it's no problem i'll just have my brother like send some down it's it's, it's not that big of a deal and he was really intrigued so we started talking a little bit more about it, and uh, you know, the more I looked at it, there really wasn't an avenue for the sort of fish that I was accustomed to getting. 
um, back home because I would just pick it up right off the you know, there's the boats coming off um, where where the company is located is right on the fish pier. So boats pull up, they offload. I would take it, cut it, and bring it home, and that was that. Um, a level of freshness that almost no one else would be accustomed to. I mean, not unless you go to Greenpoint Fish, no. <laughs> <laughs> when you were working as a as an attorney, were you part of a firm? Did you go into an office every day? Were you kind of doing your own thing? Um, and how far away from the company fish world did you did you go like were you doing one foot in one foot out or were you really being like a full-time lawyer in new york city um i mean i i I was never like full-time at at a at a real firm i did like i i did work at firms but um i also wanted to do my label and my my side job which was uh you know doing like more punk stuff um, so yeah, but yeah, I would put on a suit and go down to 80 Pine street and, and go in and, and then at night go to shows and then that sort of thing. But as far as a fish, uh, the nature of, I, of my heritage is, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just part of it and, uh, I'm part owner of the company and as small as it may be. Um, and I, I've, it's just never left me and I've always, I, I there's a big, um, seafood show in, in Boston every year that the entire world attends. And uh, I've been going to that one for 20 years. I mean, it's actually next weekend, I'm going next weekend. But even when I was doing things that weren't related directly to fish before Greenpoint opened, I was still going up there, meeting people, talking about what's going on, who's... who's uh... how, how did your uh, great-great-grandfather get started? Was he a fisherman that saw potential for... Uh, distribution channels in a different way like h- how does someone in the 1880s uh build that type of company well actually um so my great great grandfather was born in ireland and his his uh his sister and his father took a boat to come to boston to move um during the the famine and on the boat, the father, my great 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 grandfather, uh, his appendix burst and he died, and they buried him at sea. And um, so then, my the 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 son and the daughter land in Gloucester, Massachusetts, and they don't have anything to do. Um, Gloucester's a huge fishing town, so he's just started fishing. Um, the the uh, that's actually part of the family lore, is it? The the daughter married a protestant and no one ever talked to her ever again so there may be a whole a whole section of the family in in the north shore of massachusetts that i just don't know about because we just we don't even know what happened to her um but so he started fishing he got good hired a few guys they started fishing together hired more guys um he actually founded the company in the 1880s and then became it became pretty successful and then his son ran it until the 1940s, and then my great uncle ran it. And it's uh, we've been very fortunate, but uh, they're great innovators. Um, f- the first company to figure out how to bring seafood from Alaska on trains. Uh, they did a lot of business. One of the first companies to do business with post-war Japan um, to do you know fish exporting and importing. So they they've always had a big picture idea when it comes to to seafood, which up until very recently, seafood has been hyper local. You know, just uh, the fishermen go out and catch, bring it in, and and feed the communities. And lately, it's it's just it's gotten to a global market where ninety percent of the food that we or I forget what the the statistic is, but eighty something percent of the food that we eat comes from somewhere else. And there's there's tons of fish right here that can be caught and harvested in a sustainable, ecologically uh, responsible manner, and we don't have to go and get processed fish from China or or uh, Thailand or that sort of thing. Yeah, I I, I want to spend some time discussing the actual fish. Uh, I I want I guess we can start with how does Greenpoint source and 
Uh, and then we'll kind of move on to navigating what fish is acceptable mm-hmm. to eat and not, which is super confusing to people in the restaurant industry. Like cooks at restaurants still aren't even 100% sure what things are acceptable, what things are overfished. So I don't think even people that go to a store have any idea. So first off, if you can talk a little bit about Greenpoint sourcing, how you and Adam make decisions on what you're going to carry and what you're going to distribute. Um, so pretty much... I, I like to uh, I like to buy according to what's in season. Um, first of all, that's that's number one. Um, we have a, a pretty pretty good guideline provided to us by some sustainability rating a- ratings agencies that uh, Monterey Bay Seafood, uh, the Seafood Watch program, Fish Watch. Um, there's and these these ratings these ratings agencies will give uh, green, yellow, or red ratings based on what the ecological impact of that fishery is. Um, sometimes they're a little bit more esoteric than, than others in their reasoning, but that's our framework. And, uh, and inside that framework, I look at seasons. So we'll, we'll get things that are local here. Um, we really like striped bass in the, in the, uh, in the fall when it's coming down on the fall run, but generally we don't really buy it at other times. I mean, there's, it's, it's down in Maryland. It's, um, in Virginia, but right now we're we're just we're focusing on local fish. Tuna is another big one. Is that we we do a lot of local tuna during the season, but when it's out of season, which is right now, we have things that we supplement it with. And I think that for most seafood companies, that's uh, that's just blasphemous to not have tuna. And uh, I think a lot of my customers will say that they say, "Well, I'll just take like ten pounds of tuna and say, well, I, we don't carry it.'" And they how can you not carry tuna? Is it the number one fish that everyone has all the time on every menu? You go anywhere, you see tuna in some some sense. Um, but I would say that we do seasonality, local fish, um, and we like to be as traceable as we possibly can get. So um, if we know that there's a fisherman in New Jersey and he's going out with a small rig and hand reeling fish and taking good care of it, we want that fish more than if it's something from a trawl boat in uh, in Virginia in a, in a big um, something uh, something in a, like a, a a bigger more commercial aspect. So I, I guess it would be seasonality, uh, transparency, and um, and low impact. But you've hit on a dangerous proposition for a business owner, which is saying no to your customer. It's uh, terrible. It's extremely. Uh, worrisome, I imagine, to have to turn down <laughs> money, but even more so than that, you can only probably tell someone no x number of times before they say, "I guess I'm gonna go. So- <laughs> I guess I'm gonna go somewhere else." How do you reconcile staying true to the ethos of your sort of family heritage and also the business decisions that you and Adam make, but also? Uh, trying to make a, a successful business? Is it like educating your customer or how do you convince them to make a secondary choice and still buy fish from you? I mean, that, that is like, that is the biggest challenge that, that we've had in the wholesale um, business for sure. And I think that when we had the restaurant, or I mean, we still have the restaurant, but in the restaurant, someone is coming in to dine there and they're essentially a captive audience. Um, it's not like they say like, all right, well, I'm just going to order a pizza then and I'll still sit here. <laughs> They're there to eat. So you can kind of, uh, what we like to do at the restaurant is take the, the familiar, um, like a fish taco and, br- and bring in some unfamiliar fish species like a, a sea robin or, or things that you wouldn't normally see in, um, in a fish taco so that when people eat it and they say, oh, if they see sea robins elsewhere or something else like a, a pollock or or, or something that isn't cod or mahi, if they see that elsewhere, they say, you know what, I had that once at Greenpoint Fish and Lobster and it was really good. And now maybe they've broadened their horizons a bit um, in that regard. But it is completely different in the wholesale aspect because you know, we're one of dozens of companies that will bring it to your, right to your door for about the same price. Quality varies, um, but it's pretty much the same. And, and we do run into that problem that if we don't have something day after day, it, it, it does become difficult, but we've been 
doing this for about two years now, and we've established enough of a rapport with a lot of the chefs that we that we work with that that they, they, they trust us enough to know that um, we're gonna we're bringing the best product. And I mean, and sometimes it, it's really hard to say. They say, you know, like, well, why don't you have any of this fish? I'm like, well, <laughs> have you looked outside? lately <laughs> like do you want to go take a boat out there and uh and fish it because we our, our warehouse is is uh is effective and efficient but it's small and we we do a full turn uh every day and a half and it's it's thousands and thousands of pounds uh tens of thousands of pounds a, a month and we do full turns on it so everything comes in and goes right out with that, that that's good for freshness and quality and um and inventory, but it's not good for when there's no fishing for four days because then nothing's coming in fresh and the quality it, it diminishes exponentially um, when it comes out of the water. But, uh, you know, it, we've been lucky enough to have people that are willing to accept this. And I, th- I think that I actually tried to do something similar to this in Boston in uh, probably 07 or 08 and, uh, there was there was a woman working at the company and, and she had a very similar vision and trying to push these sorts of more ecologically friendly options to chefs and we would go and give a pitch and say well this is why we really think this is great for you and this is great for the environment and they would just say mm, yeah it's like two dollars more though we're, we're just not interested and I think that New York is is uh, is unique in that there people are willing to 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 take that. To, to take that little bit of extra money if they know that it's it's a higher quality, better product. Whereas I think that other markets just, I don't know if they're not there yet. I mean, I've been in New York now for eight years. Um, so maybe it's even helpful <laughs> to find chefs that are actually wearing it as a badge of honor Absolutely. to not have the tuna salmon striper on the menu Absolutely. and going in a completely different direction and, and saying, yeah, I'll take that bizarre fish that I've never heard of that you're recommending yeah. to me that has, you know, great flavor. Um, from a from a purchasing standpoint, do you pre-buy inventory? I mean, obviously you have fishermen relationships, but just how, how do you how do you know that so you've got all your clients, you've got your wholesale clients mm-hmm. and you know that they're going to need x amount of certain type of fish. How do you manage that flow it's such a perishable product the logistics of it seem kind of maddening I, I, how does the fish get from the water onto the boat to you to the to the client yeah i mean well this is this is why uh this is why my mom sent me uh one of those home blood pressure kit testers <laughs> because this it's a i mean i i always i'm i'm always guessing just to know like what the chefs are going to need and it is it's it's very tough when I go and buy something that is highly perishable and I put it in my inventory and then they say, Oh, we changed the menu. I said, oh, I'm, I'm sitting on like, you know, 8,000 pounds of this stuff. Like, what am I going to do with it? I mean, we eventually are able to kind of move it around. We have a, we have a great sales team. Um, uh, but it, it's really, it's really just kind of a guessing game and knowing your customer. I, I, I the worst part, uh, hands down, the worst part though is, when I have all the products that I know that I need, with uh, I generally account for about a ten to fifteen percent overage. And I, there was a, in that that cold snap a month or two ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it was too cold to harvest clams. It was even too cold to harvest clams in Virginia. So there's no clams anywhere, and no one had any. And I was I was sitting on about four thousand pieces, and uh, which isn't a, a terrible amount, but there's a lot of a lot of people that are coming out of the woodwork that were like, "Oh, I want clams." Like, I didn't know you, you. It was on your menu, but and and that's that's the worst part because then you want to get new business, but you also want to take care of the people that you already have relationships with. So when markets get tight and and people call, and I mean, I'll know when something is really tight when we just get a random email like, "Hey, you have any uh, fluke?" Because we're sure that they called everyone else and everyone said no, <laughs> which is actually the, the best part about fresh fish when you're doing something that is truly local and a commodity is that 
it's I mean it's not like uh, it's not like there's a secret ocean that that someone else is fishing in that like my competitor can go to and I can't. It's coming from the same waters with on the oftentimes the same boats at the same docks, and it's just it's just a matter of um, I mean at that point it, it might just be a matter of branding and relationships, which is kind of what I'd like to get away from because so much of the fish is this is similar and we do have some fishermen that take extra good care of their product, um, really low uh, impact fishing. They'll bleed on boat and ice brine and pack perfectly. And when you open the box and every single fish looks pristine, that's worth more money to someone instead of something that's just like kind of thrown around and a little beat up. I mean, but there's, there's customers for that too. So it is, it's always, every day is a puzzle trying to figure out exactly how much can go where and, and who can get what. Um, it's, it's been a challenge. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to let your blood pressure drop a little bit. <laughs> uh, we're going to uh, have one commercial, and then we'll be right back here on the line. More in a minute. Today's program was brought to you by Wisconsin Cheese. What do you think of when you hear Wisconsin Cheese? For me, I think cheese curds. Delicious, fresh and squeaky cheese curds. Or deep fried cheese curds. Cheese curds literally any way, any time, any place. I think about Andy Hatch and Upland's Cheese, the farmstead cheese company behind Pleasant Ridge Reserve. I think of delicious stinky Limburger and its long storied history. I think of Dunbarton Blue, made by master cheesemaker Chris Raleigh. I think of Ross Grand Cru Sirchois, which was named 2016's World Championship Cheese, and Satori's Black Pepper Bella Vitano, the 2017 U.S. Championship Cheese. Wisconsin produces the world's best cheese, with lush grasslands and a glacial water supply that produce the very best milk. Fourth-generation cheesemakers combine old-world tradition with new ideas and the highest standards to make innovative cheeses that win more awards than any other state or country. To learn more, visit wisconsincheese.com. Welcome back to The Line here on Heritage Radio. I'm your host, Eli Sussman, and my guest today is Vinnie Milburn. He is uh, one of the owners of Greenpoint Fish and Lobster. They've got a restaurant and a wholesale operation. And we've been talking in the first part of the program a lot about Vinnie's family in Boston. They uh, have been in the business for for as long as almost anybody since the 1880s. And, uh, and Vinny uh, worked for them for a while and then spent some time being a lawyer. And of course, now he's back in the fish business. Uh, can you help define for the listeners a little bit just some of the lingo that we're hearing these days? Uh, pole caught, uh, line caught, uh, farm raised. Uh, what's, what are good verbiage that they hear and what are the things that people should stay away from when they're purchasing fish if they can't come up to Greenpoint if they're listening from another city and they're going to their local fish market like what should they be looking for when they're trying to make a responsible fish purchase I mean I think that's that's the that's the hardest question uh, because and I think that every time anyone asks me they say oh so I hear that you know a lot about sustainable fish and I say yes they say, like, well, what fish should I buy? And I'd say that it like, because I think everyone is looking for that one secret fish that I say, oh, well, it's, uh, you know, like something fish. And they say, oh, I've never heard of that. I'm like, yep, that's perfectly good. Buy that and you're good to go. It's a little bit more nuanced and you really have to have an in-depth knowledge of, of how things work. And I think that the issue is that for so long, people have just pushed buzzwords out like, farm raised everyone knows farm raised is bad or that's what we've been told since the 80s um but now actually farm raising fish and recirculating aquaculture systems is the best way to get fish possible um the wild stocks are just we're too dependent on them and if we continue to be that dependent our children won't have them 
or maybe our children's children won't have them. But um, farm fish has come a really long way in the past 20, 30 years. Um, they, they've made, I mean, just like any industry, when it first starts out, there's, there's uh, hiccups. But uh, at this point, there's many farm fish that if they're taken care of and coming from recirculating aquaculture systems, uh, they are, they're the best possible thing you can get hyper sustainable. Um, they'll, they're well managed. Um, there's no environmental impact. There's no, because it's all closed system. There's, there's no possibility of escape and, and ruining wild stocks. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of caviar that's made that way now. So even you can feel good about eating caviar, um, from, you know, from these sorts of things. So I think that that would be, that would be one thing to think about, but again, you can't just say all farm raised is good, all wild caught is bad or, or vice versa. Um, it, unfortunately it requires a lot of knowledge. And I think that this is why we always tell people that you have to just, uh, create a relationship with your fishmonger, whoever that may be. And it may be, I mean, if, if it's, if it's some, if you, it may be the guy at the whole foods counter, um, it may be the guy at the Greenpoint fish counter or, or wherever, but these people have working knowledge. And if you start to get to know a little bit more about it, you can make a more informed decision. And there's plenty of literature out there online that you can, you can start to read up on. And do you suggest Monterey Bay? Monterey Bay is really good. Mm -hmm. Um, and they have a really, uh, I mean, it's at some point it's a, a little bit too easy and it doesn't really explain the nuances all that well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but it's a good way of, of getting a primer of, of knowing uh, of what the, what the seafood that you are consuming, what impact that has. Fish still can be very intimidating pe for people to, to prepare. Uh, I think... In, in America, everyone's pretty much mastered the home cooked steak, but the home cooked fillet of fish still <laughs> eludes many people in their in their ability to master it. Do you offer classes at the at the shop, or do you teach butchering or anything like that, so people can buy a whole fish and feel confident about breaking it down? Is yeah, that something that you offer? That my my partner Adam, that's he's definitely more in that camp where he. <laughs> He, he's a great cook and he loves to do it all himself. Um, and we've been offering classes at the Brooklyn kitchen where you can break down a whole fish, use, uh, you know, scale it, fillet it, use the, cook the fillets, use the, the bones to make stock. And it's, it's actually a lot easier than, than, than you think I can do it, but I don't, I, I'm not, <laughs> I don't really like to also, I mean, my hours are so weird when I get out of work sometimes at eight or 9 AM and I'm ready for dinner, and I can't even find a place open to serve breakfast. You know, it's yeah. It's so <laughs> it's 11:30 right now, and you've been up for a full day already. Uh, yeah, this I've, is like the end of your day. Thank you for coming and doing an interview when it's like your nighttime. I was, essentially. I was actually out kind of late last night too, I, <laughs> like 10:30 p.m. And I was that that is very late for me. I got up around 1:30, um, went into work, finished work. Now I'm now I'm here. Um, before we before we talk a little bit about Adam, I, I do want to hear about this kind of w crazy work schedule. It's it's uh, baker's hours. You really are working when it's dark out. How often are you? So you're getting to your Long Island City warehouse at about one o'clock to start working on orders and things like that. Uh, yeah, I mean it, it it depends, and it's uh, most of <clears throat> most of purchasing is is done by a personal relationship that I have with, with people that I've known for many years or that I'm family with or, or, or whatever. But the purchasing is the easy part. It's logistics that is very frustrating. Um, there's, there's a great system of, uh, of cold storage trucks that run up and down the East Coast and all over the country. And they're, they're, uh, they're very reliable. But, I mean, even when something misses its mark one out of 10 times, I mean, that's the one time that I'm going to screw something up for a customer. I don't have it for their special dinner and then they're going to, you know, so I'm always, I'm up just checking on trucks, getting confirmations of, of shipping. And, and I mean, even like calling into boats and saying like, well, you know, we weren't able to get in until, so we're not going to offload. And there's a lot of government oversight with these things too. So sometimes you need a, a, a member of, uh, 
the, the government to be there to make sure that you're actually doing your quota counts correct and everything. So sometimes it takes a little bit extra time to offload. And if it's in North Carolina, I mean, you can't just get it here in, in a couple hours. It, it takes it takes a lot more than that. So I, that's what I'm doing first. And then I go in, start to look at orders, put things together, do a little bit of purchasing for the next day. Um, our trucks leave to go on deliveries at 6 a.m. So everything has to be completely packed and ready for them at that time. So, and then once, once they're gone, then I, I kind of do some paperwork and then, and then get out. And then you eat dinner at eight in the morning. <laughs> well, I, I, it's just, it is, I, there's so many places, especially in Long Island city, there's some, there's places to get breakfast and I, I love breakfast, but I mean, sometimes it's just like, look, I, I've been up for nine hours and I've worked a full day. I had Don't eggs, eggs at, and toast. I had eggs at 2am already. <laughs> uh, the, the travel time that you just were talking about, say from North Carolina or, or, you know, another coming off a boat in another port, do you at Greenpoint purchase or serve fish that isn't coming, uh, from a drivable distance? Like, do you buy fish from Japan and, and how um, does that work? Is it flash frozen? How exactly does that work? We, we, we have very limited imported fish. Um, but there are some fish that just, uh, the other countries just do better. Um, the Europeans really do a good job with these, uh, these closed system farmed fish. Um, and so we, we buy those from there. Uh, we do a lot with Alaska, um, and some West coast, but I mean, it's mostly, mostly just drivable distance, um, places that you can, you can get here in a day or less. And Alaska, does that, does that come on a plane? Is that uh, how it gets here? Yeah, I mean, it doesn't we, come on a boat, right? No, no, no that would it, take way it too would long. E- it either comes on a train or or trucks or or a plane. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Alaska Air is usually the the preference, but um, a lot of things get shipped to Seattle first, and then and they're sent from there. So um, we pick up at JFK once in a while if we have to. It's just it's really annoying to get there and go through a lot customs and wait for everything and have it cleared and so you go to a special pickup area at jfk <laughs> just, like yeah a just the cargo cargo area. yeah just back the truck up to the um to the uh to the loading dock and they'll, they'll put it on it's it is uh it's something that i mean and that's just second nature for me because when i was you know when i was much younger i would do things from washing trucks to <laughs> to crashing trucks to uh <laughs> picking up at the airport every day uh, cutting the heads off off fish, or the one that I hated most was using the the skinning machine for for flounder, because like you'd have to like drop the flounder in, and it would pinch you. Um, but I, so I've I've done I've done so much of this that like it's not when when it's time for someone to say like oh well you know uh, I'm shipping into JFK cargo um, it's at the Air China Building 74 in cargo hold D and so yeah that's fine and I'll, because I, I've, I've it's just kind of second nature that you just like this is how you do it like you have to constantly be moving and picking things up and and there's there's this great system of cold storage facilities all up and down the east coast that trucks can pick up and drop off at and uh, I mean everything's really just run through these trucks and I have two refrigerated trucks of my own and uh, I'll just go down there pick it up and it's all there consolidated from north south wherever and um, that's pretty much it what I what I love is that you have pretty much for your entire life been in a business where you deal with a perishable item and you realize the complexity of it and then you thought yeah I'll open up a restaurant (laughs) (laughs) I I think a restaurant would be a next logical choice so so you and Adam, and I'm curious a little bit about, so Adam's uh, also came from a music background. Yes. So you joined up together, and you've got this family fish experience, and Adam is the chef of Greenpoint Fish. How do you both come together and make this decision? Had Adam previously been working in restaurants? Did you guys work on recipes uh, together? For those that haven't been, Greenpoint uh, fish, it has a retail component towards the front, but there's also seats and a full on menu. There's a there's a restaurant at the back of it and, yep. a, and a counter where you can watch your dishes being prepared. So besides as an avenue to just 
sell some fish to yourself. Why did you guys decide to open up a restaurant and not just go wholesale? I mean, the, the wholesale, it actually was the other way around is that um, Adam was really interested in doing a project like this. And he asked me what I thought. And I told him that he was out of his mind. <laughs> I was, I was like, look, I'm not, you know, like this is, this is crazy. It's especially to be an all seafood uh, restaurant. I mean, protein costs are high already. It, it's not, we don't have a burger to offset anything. It's, it's a, it's a big endeavor. And had we had the restaurant experience when we opened it, we might have thought about it a little differently. Um, but, you know, I kept telling you it was crazy so long that eventually I became crazy too. And <laughs> we decided that we'd, uh, we'd try to do it. And um, we looked around for the right spot and we found it. And it happens to be on a corner in Greenpoint. Um, and, and you know, from the, from the first day, we knew that it was something special and we've been very fortunate uh, people come in and, and it's, the fish is just, is just different. It's, it's, uh, it's fresher. And I've been able to, um, I'm able to source a little bit differently so I can get a little better product. Maybe I have to pay a little bit more, but I, I can always be moving it in. And I mean, from the very beginning, restaurants would come in and say, can we buy some stuff from you wholesale? And I mean, the, my walk-in is, is, you know, it's tiny. It's like a, the size of a closet at, at the at the restaurant, and we would fill it up to the brim every single day, and then and then have it be depleted by the end of the day. And I just said, like, I, we can't do orders of ten or twenty pounds. It's just I mean, that's just too much. So we said no for a long time, and then enough people kept asking that I was doing these special orders, and it, it got to be really annoying because. I have to take it in and then deliver it right away and try to figure out what the weight was and how to invoice. And so eventually we just decided, you know what, this is the way it's it's organically progressing. And I think that people are interested in, in this sort of product here in a way that I really didn't find them to be in Boston. And uh, and so we just we, we went full steam with the with the wholesale location. Well, because now that we're hearing that you kind of did it flipped the other way. Uh, yeah I, I am curious about the process of uh fundraising and pitching and how you were able to open up the restaurant uh neither one of you had owned a restaurant prior mm -hmm. um and so how did you go about kind of building your business plan and also did you go to friends and family in order to raise money and was there a ton of pushback like did your did your family say stick to wholesale or stick to being a lawyer well, or my, yeah, my, my mom said why <laughs> why are you I mean, you know i mean but they they've been really supportive um uh and and we did go to friends and family we did get a couple uh you know outside uh investors um but mostly we we did it bootstrapping um we did a lot of pop-up events for two years um which we would just buy fish and prep it and have these little events at uh, I mean, remember uh, Crown Vic? We did a bunch of uh, a bunch of events there, lobster bakes and mussel boils and all, all sorts of things. Um, and that we were just always building uh, a better brand for ourselves, and which is that's Adam's expertise. And so eventually, people were coming and and uh, kept coming to our events and they talked to their friends and there were other people that were looking to invest a little bit of money. And, and that's kind of how we did it. Uh, when we were looking for funding for the, the next location, it was, I mean, we had to turn people away because it, you know, it was, uh, people were looking to get involved for sure. Um, but we, we really, uh, we're, we're very lucky because the first day that either one of us ever worked in a restaurant was the day we opened which is, and I, I, I apologize if anyone listening is, is uh, offended because I know how much it takes to get people to, to really come up through the ranks and start as a dishwasher, busboy, maitre d', and move up and, then, and, and finally get to a level. It's just we were looking to do a fish market, not a restaurant. Um, we wanted to have a fish market where people come in and buy things. And then we thought, yeah, I mean, maybe we'll have like a chowder and like a little induction burner and we'll like cook some tacos. But the place we ended up, um, renting or, uh, was had a full kitchen in it and they had, it had just been renovated. 
Uh, the guy had put a lot of money into it. Six months later, it was closing, so a lot of this stuff was brand new. And we said, "Well, you know what? Let's just try it. Let's try this and see what we can do." And it, it's been it's worked out really well for us. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about the the headaches and the extreme difficulty. But on the positive side, what's been the most satisfying for you as you've grown? So you've got the the market and the restaurant. What has been like a pleasant surprise for you over the course of this whole process? Uh, I mean, it's really it's really hard to see the big picture when I'm so stuck in the in the daily routine because. Um, like I said, so much of the purchasing is very personal. Um, and if I'm, if I happen to be out of reach someday and someone calls one of my partners, uh, maybe that person doesn't want to deal with them or something. And like, I miss out an opportunity. Um, but I think the most satisfying, uh, I mean, I think that is this, this, uh, this analogy that I use a lot. Um, and it seems that, that, when we were when we were younger, everyone wanted to be a rock star, right? Like they wanted to be Kurt Cobain, or they wanted to be someone, you know, Slash or something, someone that was up on stage and performing, being creative. And now, it seems that after Sean Parker and Napster, where someone and and now Mark Zuckerberg and these people are just like regular guys that become huge industry disruptors. And I think that everyone wants to be an entrepreneur now, and. It is it is like it is something that I've always looked forward to doing and, and being my own boss, um, and that's very satisfying. But at the same time, it is it is a very very difficult lifestyle. As 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 you know, it's 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 a more than a full time job. It's a, it's a life, and uh, I think that once once we uh, once we hit a few more milestones, I, I can look back and really be satisfied. But until then, I, I'm just still plugging away. So I think that. I think that we'll have to reconvene in about a year and, and see if I can have a day off. I, I I haven't taken a day off since Christmas Day. I don't anticipate one in a while, but I, I'm not that I'm complaining. It's just that's just how it is. I need to buy fish every single day. Vinny, thanks so much for joining us here on the line. It's been a pleasure to hear your story and hear how Greenpoint Fish <clears throat> and Lobster is doing and the wholesale operations. Uh, please let people know where they can find you if they want to come in and visit the restaurant or buy some fish Great. for use at home. Uh, the, the restaurant is at 114 Nassau Avenue at the corner of Eckford Street in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. It's uh, two blocks from the Nassau G. We also have a Long Island City location that we do. Um, we, it's just a retail, but we also teach some oyster shucking classes and a couple other things. And that is at 543 48th Avenue, Long Island City. It's uh, close to the Vernon Jackson 7 train. We're going to get you out of here so you can go to sleep. Everybody, thanks for listening. I'm actually going to have lunch, I think. <laughs> uh, everybody, thanks for listening to this episode of The Line here on Heritage Radio. We'll see you next week, Tuesdays at 11, for a new interview with a chef or restaurateur. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Ever wonder what kind of podcast Julia Child would have made? Probably would have been one where she introduced you to all of her latest discoveries and favorite people. 
And that's exactly the tradition we're following on Inside Julia's Kitchen, a podcast of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. Join me, Todd Schulk, and your host, and the Foundation's Executive Director, as I bring you inside the Foundation's world to meet the bright lights of today's food universe, just as Julia used to do from her own famous kitchen. New episodes air on Heritage Radio Network, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Listen in.